Oh, really? <laughs> Your punches are actually fast enough that the zoom call can't pick up the frame rate. You just turn it to a blur when you're moving really quick. I think it's the internet issue we got here, <laughs> not because I'm so fast. <laughs> that is Summer John, a boxer who runs a boxing gym on the outskirts of Istanbul, Turkey. And he's giving me and my brother a boxing lesson in my living room over Zoom. So this is the first time I'm, I will be teaching online. The first time you're teaching online? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, I'm super excited. My brother said there's a cool boxing class going on, so I had to join in. <laughs> and you'll hear a three-year-old running around in the background. That's David. Sorry, he's playing with a balloon. Yeah, he's welcome to join us. It was my first real boxing lesson. Sabrjan made it easy. He's patient, but he also pushed us. He has this kind of mischievous energy. Keeps you on your toes. So let's uh, begin with, the, are you all uh, right-handed? I'm right-handed, my brother is left-handed. Okay, that's, that will make it more interesting then. <laughs> <laughs> so you can begin with, uh, you put your feet as your shoulder, and then you put uh, your strongest leg one step back. Got it. So try to move back and forth without losing the position. It's really like dancing. Yeah, exactly. Quite simple, right? Front, two step, back two step, to the left, two step, to the right, two step. And just relax, you know? Front, front, right, left, right, left, left, back, left, back, left, back, back, right, back. right. Right. Okay. You look like a boy band. <laughs> <laughs> and always remember, keep your uh, hands up, okay? You look really cool right now. I feel like I do not look cool. <laughs> really? <laughs> we got we, we have friends that saying uh, they want to learn. As they said, please teach us. <laughs> Okay, so that was my first boxing lesson. And you can hear some folks shouting in the background and approaching Samarjan, asking him to train them. And that's partly because where Samarjan and the members of his gym are from, just being caught with boxing gloves can land you in jail. We girls dream about become a boxer. So now in Turkey, they have opportunity to try it. So in this way, it's special for Igor. Uyghurs are a mostly Muslim ethnic minority from northwestern China, a region that's officially called the Xinjiang Autonomous Region. Many Uyghurs refer to their homeland, Xinjiang, as East Turkestan, which is what we'll call it. Although the Uyghur trace back their history there for thousands of years, the Chinese government sees it as theirs and have occupied the region since 1949. And so the Uyghur homeland has become a very contested space. For Summer John, boxing isn't fighting against something, it's fighting for something. It's self determination. <laughs> I'm Salim Rashamwala, and from TED, this is Far Flung. In each episode, we look at a different location to understand ideas that flow from that place. This week, Istanbul, Turkey, where a community in exile is seeking to preserve their cultural identity while also integrating into Turkish society. And we're going to see how this sweaty gym is a portal to do that. We are in the biggest mosque in this area. Generally, I try to be in the mosque at least once a day. It's beautiful, clean and big, and a lot of Uyghur come here. We just met a few of my friends before I went in. Can you tell me, as you're looking around right now, how would you describe this area to relatives or family who have never left home? I will tell them it's just like a part of our capital city, Urumqi especially because of the Uyghur restaurants, bakeries. I can buy almost everything that I can buy in my hometown, especially when it comes to food. So I will tell them they will feel home here. Samarjan is in Zeytinburnu, an immigrant neighborhood on the outskirts of Istanbul. Here, you'll see Uyghurs wearing headscarves, men with beards, bookstores with a huge variety of Uyghur books, all things that were banned in China. About 50,000 Uyghurs have settled in Turkey, which hosts more migrants and refugees than any country in the world. 
Istanbul's this bustling mega city of about 15 and a half million people. It's literally and metaphorically on the line between Asia and Europe. A lot of people talk about the city as straddling a split identity, and that's especially true for Uyghurs. Their homeland, which is 3,000 miles away from Istanbul, is huge, about the size of Alaska. So the Uyghurs are, of course, a diverse community, but as far away as they are from home, one thing that makes them feel closer is that they can find Uyghur food here. You'll find hand-pulled noodles tossed in a rich lamb broth, steamed buns, savory dumplings with a spicy dipping sauce, cumin spiced skewers, fluffy homemade bread. I gained like almost 10 kilo in the first two months because I was eating Uyghur food all the time. <laughs> Uyghur food is basically comfort food and it's often served in large portions, communal style. Actually, I feel more like I am in some place in East Turkestan than, uh, than I am in Istanbul. Like I feel home here because I see people I, I knew from my country, especially when I train them in the gym, but I also see them around in the neighborhood. So I'm around them all the time. Summer John's gym is called Palawan, which means... The direct translation will be a wrestler but uh, we also use it as a, a kind of description of a kind of macho and a hero figure. And Summerjan himself is kind of like a superhero, especially to a lot of the kids who train at his gym. In your experience, you know, kids who get in a lot of fights, do they tend to be good boxers? No, uh, normally it's quite opposite. Generally speaking, as an aggressive one, as the one, you know, who is dominating others in the street, they end up having a, a lesson there. And as those who are like, don't have much confidence in the street and, you know, shy, and they will find out if they learn and put effort in it, actually, they are stronger than what they thought. Uh, this is an amazing part of boxing. They will put balance in the group dynamic of the youth on a more respectful and healthy way. Giving young Uyghurs a space to let loose and break a sweat goes a long way towards balancing out the stress in their lives. When you're focused on not getting punched in the face, you can't be distracted by your very real daily worries. One time Summer John can look back to where he didn't have many worries was his early childhood. He spent his first few years in the countryside at his grandmother's house in East Turkestan in China. We used to have a lot of animals in our backyard, fruit trees. It felt like it was timeless. So it was really freedom that I have experienced in the highest level. Sometimes, like any kid, he'd get in trouble for pushing that freedom a little too far. Like when he tried to teach some of his grandmother's chickens to fly. I was looking at the chickens and saying, OK, you got so big wing, but you cannot fly. Let me teach you. So I used to... <laughs> I used to catch them and uh, climbing up to the uh, top of the house and uh, threw it down from there. I hope it can learn how to fly. <laughs> but uh, one day I, I threw it down again and it was a well in the, uh, in the backyard. And uh, the well was not covered that day. It was like totally open and uh, 20 meter down is the water we used to drink. So I threw the chicken from the roof and it fly directly into the well. <laughs> How did the chickens feel about being thrown from your grandmother's house? It was the last time I was teaching them how to fly. <laughs> Those carefree chicken throwing days changed when he and his family moved to Arumchi. Summer John attended a Chinese school there. It was like 60 students in one class. So it was like a military style discipline. The way we see it, the way we act. <laughs> we talk. So it was almost like uh, jail for me. Around the same time in 1996, the Chinese state began a, quote, strike hard campaign against the Uyghurs. It was to prevent what they feared would be a Uyghur separatist movement. The language the government used was really strong. One official described it as a campaign to, quote, break their lineage, break their roots, break their connections and break their origins. Basic forms of Uyghur identity and cultural expression were increasingly seen as suspicious, especially sports. Summerjohn recalls a Uyghur boxer who rose to fame when he was a kid. He would copy his moves in the streets with his friends in the neighborhood. You can become national hero when you beat up other boxers who are Chinese. So it was like this kind of nationalism feeling. It was always ethnical tension in every level. 
in the school, in the working place. Things eventually got so bad that Samarjan and his mom left East Turkestan for Denmark when Samarjan was 13 years old. He says Denmark was a culture shock and the mostly immigrant neighborhood could be rough. A lot of kids fell into crime and gangs, but he found one of the easiest ways to make friends was through sports. He didn't take boxing so seriously at first, but he reconsidered after his first match. Like, it was so fast. It was a knockout in first round. I was so nervous and excited and <laughs> I was shaking before the match and I get up in the ring and it took not more than one minute before <laughs> I knock him out. <laughs> then I feel really sorry for him <laughs> and find out, okay, it's uh, easier than I thought. Summerjohn kept boxing and he even started competing in tournaments. He used what he learned in the ring to mentor other immigrant kids from his neighborhood who were struggling to adjust to life in Denmark. The rigors of boxing gave them some structure and discipline. But even though Summerjohn was adjusting pretty well to life in Denmark, he still missed home. After he graduated, he was planning on becoming a civil engineer and moving back to East Turkestan. But in late 2017, his plans changed. It was a sudden decision because I was preparing to move back to East Turkestan. And suddenly my family, friends telling me not coming back, something is happening, without telling me what exactly happening. Samarjan started hearing about the mass surveillance of Uyghurs and their forced assimilation in detention camps. It's estimated that over a million Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities are currently detained within a secret network of Chinese government-run camps and prisons. So this is actually a terrible situation. Uh, and I don't know what they are becoming. Like, they will, will develop identities that I am afraid that I will not recognize them when I see them later in my life. It's the largest scale detention of ethnic and religious minorities since World War II. The Chinese authorities call the camps vocational education and training centers. Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch call it crimes against humanity. Chinese authorities say the camps are designed to, quote, root out extreme thoughts that breed terrorism. But if you actually look at the kinds of things people can get sent to camps for, the offenses are pretty normal stuff. That includes engaging in prayer, studying Arabic, sending money, traveling, or maintaining ties with family abroad, even just downloading WhatsApp. And as more Uyghur refugees moved to Turkey, Summerjohn decided to join them. This meant giving up the comforts of the life he was building in Denmark, a well-paid job, his network, and the stability that living in a Scandinavian country offered him. And when I landed in Istanbul, I saw a mosque, as they are calling prayer. And then I went to the Uyghur neighborhood, I saw the Uyghur shop, Uyghur bread, Uyghur people. You know, I feel like I was back in my, my hometown, so I was happy to be here. I feel really proud. Now that Summerjun was getting settled in Istanbul, he wanted to get back into training and to also deepen his connection with the Uyghur community so he could gather more information on what was really happening back in East Turkestan. Uh, so in the beginning, I just want to find out, okay, where should I start? A friend who worked at a Uyghur restaurant recommended a gym in the neighborhood where he heard some Uyghurs were boxing. Summerjun searched for the gym for weeks and he was about to give up on finding it entirely when... What's that smell? <laughs> not too bad, not the worst case, but it's not fresh air. It was also smell of uh, sweat and old boxing glove. <laughs> it's an international smell. I smelled it in Denmark, in Germany, <laughs> in Urumqi. <laughs> so not big surprise. <laughs> ah, the sweet, nostalgic smell of funky gym gloves. He found it. At the boxing club, Samarjan met a few fellow Uyghur boxers and saw a bunch of kids kind of just running around, pretty unorganized. They told Samarjan that they just happened to be looking to hire an instructor. And so he started teaching there. But an idea had started to form. What if he opened his own boxing gym, one specifically for Uyghur youth? He knew these kids needed more than just boxing lessons. Now I am here. I feel like I have to do something, anything. I feel like it's my duty. So he started his own gym. It wasn't just a place to learn jabs and hooks. 
It was a spot where youth could find community and get the resources they needed to start a new life in Istanbul. But Samarjan needed a team to really make this happen the way he wanted it to. That's after the break. You're hearing one of the instructors at Summer John's gym. He's asked that we not share his real name to protect his identity. So we're calling him Alim. Alim and his friends have a timer and they're practicing in two minute intervals with 30 second breaks. It's very intense. He comes here six days a week. It's a park by the ocean where a lot of the boxers go running as a part of their training. And it's hot out, so he got here before the sun came up. Right now, it's 7 a.m. At the end, he actually wake up in 5 a.m. in the morning and they do the morning pray and then have a breakfast and then start training. That's our translator. We're calling him Envar. He's also requested anonymity. Envar is a law school graduate who helped Summerjun run the gym. Actually, they trained for the two things today, how to avoid the direct punch and also how to do defending from the short distance attacking. I love training in the morning and it's like my daily lifestyle. But sometimes I also feel tired, don't want to come here. But the thing is that I have my friends who are more eager than me to keep coming every day. Alim started boxing as a teen at a gym back in East Turkestan in 2010. Actually, the main purpose here is like there's Chinese policemen there with weapons and we don't have anything. So at least we have to start learn some martial art to protect ourselves. It's the least thing that we can do. The purpose is not for fun. What he remembers most about that gym? The general smell is not so good. <laughs> so we always like putting perfume everywhere so we can, we can exercise it. Alim says a few months after he started training that police showed up to the gym with guns and arrested everyone there. Luckily for Alim, he was helping his parents out around the house that day. Just right after the club was closed, the environment's quite intense. Especially after that, there's some kind of regulation that there shouldn't be any kind of gathering more than two to three people. Alim and his friends continued to practice secretly at each other's homes, but they had to be careful. There's reports that some Chinese officials even moved in to live with Uyghur families who were considered too, quote, suspicious. If the police or any kind of like officials find some gloves in your home, they arrest you. At home, Alim says he hid his boxing gloves in the floor beneath the carpet so that they would not be found by the police. We also ask our trainers to come home to teach us new moves, but the trainers kind of afraid. He didn't agree, but after we insisted, like begging him, and uh, he also see our consistency, he came to our home like once a week to teach us new moves. His skills got better, but competing was still a huge risk to him and his family. The government started to arrest the young people because of boxing or they pray or they, they did go to some religious schools. Alim says he feared he could be next, and as the crackdown worsened, Alim's family agreed to let him go abroad. But he had to act quickly, before the government was able to confiscate his passport, because all Uyghur movement required government permission. He arrived in Istanbul in 2016. To protect his family from being punished for his escape, he says he wrote them a letter in which he instructed them to immediately report to the police that he was missing and had run away from home. He says he hasn't heard anything from them since. When he first arrived in Istanbul, he was struggling with loneliness and direction. Then he met Samarjan at the gym and says he finally felt some sense of belonging, safety, and trust. 
As the trainers and students at the gym got to know each other, they started to share their stories about what happened to them and their families. In the beginning, we collected testimony about disappeared family members or family members who was taken to the camp, arrested for no reason. But later, we also collect testimony about forced labor, forced sterilization, forced abortion. And right now, we are collecting testimony about the Chinese government have taken many property from people. Summer John prints out their photos, information, and stories and puts them up on a wall at the gym's office. There's not a lot of hope that these people will be found, so it feels more like a memorial. Now, to be clear, even this kind of speaking out isn't safe. Many of the Uyghurs we talked to said they fear that their families back home could be sent to the camps or killed if they speak out about what's happening in China. It's reported that Uyghurs in Turkey are still heavily surveilled by Chinese authorities. From what he's heard and seen, Samarjan says, Every single Uyghur in diaspora have at least one or two family member or friends who are disappeared or are arrested. And sometimes I meet people so afraid and they keep themselves in silence or even work for the Chinese authority. Uh, Their family actually also get targeted and arrested without any reason. For me, it's not so much different between people are in jail or in in the camps or outside East Turkestan because all East Turkestan have already become an open-air prison. I believe that even people living outside, they are terrified. They are not living in peace. Summerjohn sends the testimonies to international human rights organizations as a way to build evidence of the crimes China's government has denied. He estimates that around half of the youth who come to the gym are orphans because their parents have been arrested or sent to the camps. Like, yeah, you can go to any boxing club if it's only about sport, but uh, right now it's more about brotherhood, especially teens, uh, they don't have their family around. They are separated from their families, Mm. their parents, their siblings. So it's a nice place to uh, be together with people with similar story and background. The gym not only offers free boxing classes to boys and girls, but also free courses that address practical needs like learning English or support with applying to schools. And as you heard, It's also a space where Uyghurs can finally open up and share their feelings. For Aleem, that means processing his survivor's guilt. So training Uyghurs at the gym offers some peace of mind. He said that my main goal is not just like boxing, because actually my main goal is to let the Uyghur people, especially in Istanbul, to, to get involved in sports activity. Because we are suffering more, especially mentally, that we have to be strong, especially physically. Envar, who, in addition to translating for us, helps run the gym's programming, says mental health support is key. The boxing club is just the entry point. We have to find some loopholes, get into the, the society. And we observe that there are lots of young uh, teenagers and young adults coming to boxing. And we observe that they have lots of mental health issues. But he says it's complicated because mental health and depression can be a cultural taboo. We don't have that therapy culture in in Uyghur, okay? When you're saying that you should have to go to psychological therapy, they're saying that I'm not crazy. Do you think I'm crazy? He or she get offended, okay? They're saying that, no, I believe in God and I'm practicing. There's no need to go to therapy, okay? Also, I went through some kind of psychological problem, missing home, loneliness. I refuse to go to therapy because I'm, I'm strong. I don't need therapy. And then like one of, one of my friends in, in University of Turkish friend, like convinced me that, yeah, we're Muslim, we believe in God. We have that, that practicing part and also we have that meditation part. But the psychological problem, they're totally different. If you have some problem, you should have to go to psychological therapy or a psychiatrist. Then I, I met with a therapist and I'm feeling good, okay? I'm feeling good, I was feeling good. And uh, it actually continued for eight months. Especially after the eight months, I'm feeling so relieved. I, I feel like I'm getting cured, okay? But Envar says getting Uyghurs to go to therapy is hard because many do not trust Turkish psychologists and there are very few Uyghur psychologists. 
one of the few places they could connect with people who could really understand their community's trauma was at the gym. Maybe we can just suddenly implement some kind of group therapy without any notion. Because if you tell them we arrange a therapy for you, they're not going. So if you say that this is the Uyghur mental health center, people are saying some lame youth center can change me. So they teamed up with Turkish psychologists to bridge the gap and train the gym instructors in therapeutic techniques. But they had to be subtle about it. And if you like rename it like the boxing club, they're saying, OK, I'm going to go there to develop myself, to do some boxing and reveal myself. And we approached them with the like social worker friends. They're like, OK, why not? The gym became a place to help Uyghur youth connect their roots while also integrating into Turkish society. They're struggling now that they're refusing the Turkish identities, OK? But it's important. You're living here and there's no chance you go back to your hometown. And uh, you should, as a citizen of this country, you should have to go to their school. You should have to have the Turkish friends. And all the institutions are for you. You can both be Turkish and also the Uyghur is Turkestan people. I have different aspect of my identity. I am Uyghur. I am also a Muslim. I am also European. Now I'm becoming a Turk. For me, the identity is about value. So the thing defined who I am is my value. This is also what I want to inspire other uh, rural children, other people, with, because I can see they are going through all this confusing that I went through, because now they are in Turkey and having a lot of questions about their identity. So the boxing gym and uh, all this activity we are doing is also about to build their value and give them capacity to f- define their own identity. The gym's mission is to empower youth. And for Summerjohn, that means giving them the confidence to define themselves instead of being defined by what's happened to them. For me, freedom is something from inside. It's not environmental. If you feel it's right to do something, then do it. So for me, it's a mindset that willing to pay any price to things that uh, you believe is right to do. Uh, this is the ultimate freedom for me. It's not about doing something against China. or It's about no matter where you live, uh, try to serve the, the community. So you will become a part of the place and the place will become a part of you. Like no, no matter where I go, I'm still on the earth. So <laughs> the earth is our home uh, as, as human. Now I actually feel I belong anywhere. Where I live is where I belong. So I feel home in Istanbul. Far Flung is produced by Jesse Baker and Eric Newsom of Magnificent Noise for TED. Our on-the-ground producers for this episode are Duri Buskarin, Suli Kurban, and Elise blenner Hassett. Our production staff includes Elise blenner Hassett, Sabrina Farhi, Huete Gitana, Ben Ben Chang, Michelle Quint, Jimmy Gutierrez, and Sammy Case. With the guidance of Roxanne Highlash and Colin Helms. Special thanks to Samarjan Saidi, Kassar, Envar Yusuf, Salih, Razia Ali, Munira, and Chef Abdullah for sharing your time and stories with us. Translation and transcription by Summer John Saidi and Envar Yusuf. Our fact checkers are Nicole Bodhi and Hana Matsudaira. Ad stories are produced by Transmitter Media. This episode was mixed and sound designed by Kristen Muller and Elise Blenner Hassett. Special thanks to Yusuf Suleiman and Shoret Nur for playing and sharing your music with us. Additional thanks to Dr. Maya Wang and Dr. Rune Steenberg for your time and expertise. Our executive producer is Eric Newsom. I'm Salim Reshamwala. <laughs> <laughs>